You're listening to this week's message from the Sunday Preview, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome back to Sunday Preview. Today is March 21st, and we're looking at the text for March 26th, the fifth Sunday in Lent. We're getting in the Word. We're still in Lent. We're still in Lent. Feels like a long season, David, like you said last, was it last Wednesday where you were saying that? But Lent is supposed to be long. It's a good reflective time. So I'm here with David and Peter. We're going to get into the text and we're getting into some stories of the Bible. We were just talking before we hit record about how uh, these are familiar stories. And so there's the temptation to gloss over it or run through it quickly. I'm like, yeah, I know that story. And then miss some of the important details in the text and the important parts of the story. So we're going to do our best to take our time going through these without uh, just treating them like, yeah, I know it. I knew it when I was a kid. Let's move forward. So you guys ready? Ready. Yes. All right. So we're in Ezekiel 37, the Old Testament prophet here, Ezekiel 37 verses 1 through 14. And this is the, the story of the dry bones. So if the song in your head jumps in, great. I hope it's punishing you the way it punishes me. Um, my wife is a children's ministry director, so these these songs just live in our home. But here's Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. There was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We're indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the graves. O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. All right, David, take us into this familiar story. Wow. You know, last week I was maybe uh, grumbling a little bit at the length of Lent. It kind of wears me out. And that this Sunday we have these rich, rich text and some hope-filled text in the middle of Lent when we are repenting, confessing our sins. But here we have this crazy picture in Ezekiel. So I'll just start on one kind of minor point. If you're not familiar with Ezekiel, it has a bunch of crazy images in it. it. And I think 37 chapters in, Ezekiel has learned, right? So he has this valley of dry bones, and God asks him, can these bones live? And Ezekiel has learned by now not to answer. He just says, (laughs) Lord, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Stop trying to trick me, I've got these crazy images that the Lord has used to communicate his truth. And Ezekiel is, he's kind of like, all right, let's, let's get on with it. What you got for me here, Lord? Um, but crazy, crazy vision here of these bones coming to life. And then the hope uh, for God's people, because at the time, God's people were rebellion. In rebellion, they were, had suffered severely under God's judgment. And really, you read about the judgment in Ezekiel, and you think, man, there is no hope for these people. And yet, here you have hope in Ezekiel 37, that even if they are in the grave, God can bring them back to life. Yeah, so it's showing, it's again that, what, what jumps to me immediately is that uh, the conflict with human logic 
and the power of God. He's looking on these bones. Any human would say very dry. It said the text said very dry. So it's not like there's some kind of life still in them. They're, they're fully dead. They've been dead. They're, the, the life as we know it is out of them. And, they, and yet God raises it, which defies our logic, which I think speaks to God's obvious, his power over life and death, but also speaks to what we say often on this podcast about how God doesn't operate under man's means or what always makes sense to us. Now, during this time, this was exile time, right? So they're in Babylon, and they're thinking, no hope. Any idea how long before God actually, years-wise, brought them back? Exile was about 70 years. Okay, so they were exiled for 70 years. So wherever they are at this point, they're there long enough that they're speaking, or they've been there long enough that they're speaking, we have no hope. We have no, we have no way out of this. Peter, what are you thinking on this? Well, I also, it's, a, I think, a great uh, image for us, too, as we look at ourselves spiritually. Um, you know, before faith, faith in Christ, we were just like these dry bones. <laughs> you know, we were spiritually dead. And I think, you know, this is such a great reminder to us that I, I played no role in my resurrection spiritually. Yeah. It was 100% God's work. Um, as if the dry bones could just come up on their own. And so uh, I think for us today, it's a, it's a great reminder of, first of all, obviously, there's nothing impossible for God uh, and his, his resurrection power uh, in our own lives spiritually. Uh, it's the same, same thing. He took something that was completely dead uh, and made it alive. Right. What a powerful description. Verse 11, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are cut off. Hmm. Like, I mean, they are, that's, it's the end. It's over, but like you were saying, nothing's impossible with God. And I have to wonder how this parallels today. How this parallels, like, do people find themselves in a state like what you just repeated in verse 11 there, where you look at your life around you, you look at what's going on, And you think, there's no hope. This is pointless. God's not here. God doesn't care. God's absent. There is no God. And you find yourself in that place of despair. And yet we know that God is completely present, completely active, and completely aware. It's just his timing and his response may not be what we're hoping for. And it may be how this, this text I see pointing to the gospel and to the eternal life that that we have when we read this, because it's like you may suffer for the rest of your existence here in this life, but that doesn't mean that the eternal life to come is a fairy tale. It's just eternal life to come. And this is a broken life with sin. And so sometimes that sin just keeps, what, clouding everything and making everything difficult. Yeah, I think of, um, you know, we mentioned 70 years. So there were people born in exile. Mm -hmm. There were people who were, 50, 60 years old, who had never, who'd lived their whole life and never known anything but exile. Yeah. But then you got your parents and your, maybe your grandparents telling you, oh, no, there's these promises and we're still holding out hope that, you know, the God of Israel is going to return us home. But you've never known, like, I, I, I admire their faith that, that through that dark time, they were able to preserve the promises of God. But absolutely, and I think what gets us in trouble, what you were saying, we reach these points of despair, and God doesn't act on our timetable. He yeah. doesn't act immediately, and, and I think that pushes us to take that final step of there's no hope. We're cut off. Yeah. But ultimately, even if this life, we, we spend most of this life suffering, um, there's, still, there's still the hope that even from the grave, he's going to raise us up to new life. Right, and in like 14, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. So that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to solve your problem here. Because I think, Peter, like what you said, a little, this is spiritual life, and this was making them spiritually alive, because prior to Christ, we were spiritually dead, um, which that concept in itself is hard for people to grasp. But some, there's people who would be living just fine and say, I'm not spiritually dead. What are you talking about? And they're disconnected from the truth of the gospel right. and from Christ as as the, the Savior to it that, that gives us eternal life, but yet they, they're not there yet. 
So it's hard to it's hard to convince someone of that when life is really good. I often wonder if that's kind of the hardest mission field is is a field where pe- life is so good that someone says, "Are you kidding me? Look at my look at the commas in my bank account. I, there's nothing dead about me." Right. And yet it's talking about a different kind of life. And so often <clears throat> when you have um, materially when you are well off, that cushions you from the suffering in this life. Um, you can you can pay to soften some of the blows, but not all of them. Right. right. All right. Does anyone else, when you get to uh, verse 10, um, the breath came into them, they lived and stood to their feet, an exceedingly great army. Does anyone else think Pirates of Caribbean? <laughs> that a, would work. There's a scene in there where I don't remember which of the movies, they all blend together to me, but they, they have a yeah. scene where these, these bones become mm-hmm. this army. This, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and when I think about that, though, my mind in this story always goes to about seven or eight skeletons standing up. But yet, exceedingly great army, then, then I'm kind of forced to think, man, the sight of this must have been not only amazing, but terrifying as well. Like, what are, what are all these, let's just say thousands of now alive skeletons or, or whatever state they were in at that point, what are they going to do? Yeah. Is this God's wrath or is this God's grace or what is this? I think it's also a good reminder for us to uh, take a look at the skeletons in our own closets. Oh, nice. Nice play <laughs> there, Peter. To repent yeah. of the skeletons yes, in our own the, closets. To bring us back to Lent. Yes, <laughs> to bring us go. back to Lent. <laughs> but I, do, but I do wonder, like, were they, because it does say they, they have skin. Um, I wonder if they were brought back to the, the person that they were before. You know, the, mm, yeah. or if these were, I don't know. I do think it's interesting that there is kind of a two-stage here, right? So we go from bones to, it looks like flesh and blood bodies, but there's no breath in them. I missed right. that. So the skin this, had covered yes, them, yeah. yeah. So it kind of harkens back to creation, when God breathed breath, yeah. on Adam, right? And, and that's when life entered him. Um, but then also looks forward to um, the New Testament. So the words for spirit and wind are the same. Mm-hmm. So at Pentecost, when the wind blows, it's, you know, the translators have to kind of wrestle with, is this wind or spirit? And but, but you certainly see it here clarified as spirit, that it's the spirit that fills them and gives them life. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a connection, but this kind of points my mind to the resurrection to come on the last day where the, the body is going to be raised imperishable. And you think there's going to be, there, there's obviously because they are now, but there's decomposed bodies to nothingness. And yet God's going to raise them to a actual physical, imperishable, perfect, healthy body. Um, so how would you, and this can be an unfair question because I didn't tell you this ahead of time. I just thought of it. How would you, say you go to someone that's completely, doesn't have familiarity with the gospel or, or, or Christianity how would you explain, like, okay, what's the point of this story? What would you tell them is the point of this story? Like, why is this story in the Bible for us today? What does it mean to me today? What would you say? First thing I'd say um, to steal Peter's line that he used earlier was the story tells us that um, it's God who brings life. We cannot create life on our own. And in fact, trying to create life on our own is like expecting dry bones to defend you in a battle, you know, to be your army as a bunch of dry bones. But it is only through the work of God that we are given life. So, and obviously would develop that idea. What do I mean by life there? But um, people spend most of their lives chasing after some idea of life, Mm -hmm. trying to make life work in this world, trying to make life pleasurable enough and comfortable enough and secure enough that they can call that life. Um, but ultimately, we are dependent upon God to give life, both now, but certainly forever. That'd be one thing. That's a great point. And that's because everything about this, or let me, let, me, let me back up. Death for us is so final and it's so fearful because we know once someone's dead in almost every circumstance, they're dead. It's done. It's final. It's over. There is no bringing them back. And so that's kind of a finality to us. And I think death shows us our tremendous weakness, especially when it's a death of like a young person, because it's like, I would do anything to bring this young person back. But yet we see that we don't have power over death. But yet God says, I have power over death. 
in life. And let me show you this here. And I wonder if this is almost kind of a, a helpful testament to us when we read the book of Revelation that talks about raising the dead or wherever that is in the New Testament and talks about the last day, the resurrection of the body. And we say, okay, if there were no account of God doing that, things like these, there's other accounts, but we could say, I don't know. But now we can point back to Ezekiel and go, well, if we believe the Bible to be completely true, and everything in there is, is, is there's, no, there's no tricks, then here's God showing his power over physical death and life. So what would you say to that person, Peter, who is well, new to I would, Christianity? I, would, I just recorded what David oh, you said. Just play it back. I would sure. just play it back, yes. <laughs> Since he stole my answer anyway. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, Yeah. no, I mean, I I think that's it. I I think just relating it to our our spiritual life. Um, Now, again, like you said, if somebody that may not be too familiar with the Bible may not fully grasp that, but um, just emphasizing God's awesome power, I think, Mm -hmm. is where we can go. In speaking, I think this also speaks to God's God's grace and love for his people because— He's giving them this, this image through the prophet to share with them. Um, God doesn't toy around with our sin. It's not like he's like soft buddy Jesus God, where it's just like, oh, do whatever makes you happy. He still hates our sin, but yet he still keeps coming back to his people and calling them back and calling them back and giving them things like this to, to cling to and to hold to, even when they're going, there is no hope. There's all despair. We're, we're, we're ruined. And they're, they're not trusting God, but yet he keeps, all throughout the Old Testament, he keeps coming back and going, all right, you knuckleheads, I'm still here. I'm still pursuing you. Stop doing what you're doing. So I hear some grace in this story. And, and I really see the love, his love in about halfway through verse 12. I guess I didn't catch this before, but he says, oh, my people. Mm-hmm. You really see that compassion. You can hear it in his voice there. And he said that right after he brought up where they were saying, our hope is lost. We're indeed cut off. Like mm-hmm. there is no, it's almost like they're saying right there, there is no God and he doesn't care even if he's there. Mm-hmm. And imagine that being like a parent to a child and the child goes, there is no parent. They don't love me anymore. What's a dad? Dad doesn't. And that's, that has to cut God. I mean, God knows they're going to do it. God knows everything before it happens, but I guess I, I heard some emotion from God. Oh, my people. I hear some, some, right. some feeling in that, that time. The last thing I would say is, is just the tremendous hope. Um, when people do find themselves in places of despair and darkness and discouragement, there's a, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, there's a great scene at Helm's Deep. The Battle of Helm's Deep is about to begin, and, and there's a soldier that's just scared looking at Aragorn who will eventually be revealed as the king. But, you know, Aragorn simply tells him there's always hope. Mm. They look around them, there's no hope. They know they're trapped, they're vastly outnumbered, they are all about to die. Of course, the Ents are going to come, but that's another story. Um, (laughs) But but I just, I love that simple line, there's always hope. Right. And the believer can say that. Doesn't mean in the darkness of my marriage, God's going to fix my marriage or fix my child or relieve me of this trial I'm going through. But even if he does not, there is still hope yeah. because I have hope of a life to come. And so I, I don't know, I've, I've, in dark times, I cling to that, that idea that there's always hope. And certainly that comes through loudly in this passage that even dry bones can be brought to life. Yeah. And it's interesting how the circumstances of life that affects us in different ways. Like depending on what you're going through, there's always hope. It could sound like, yeah, man, I agree with you. Or if you're in a really low, it's like, gosh, I hope so. Like yeah. it's a, it's, it's, it's different very based on what we're going on, going through in life and what's hitting us. Sure. In those times. It really can be my last kind yeah. of clinging to faith that, okay, I'm believing there's still hope. Right. I may just barely be hanging on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump ahead to our epistle. This is Romans chapter 8. Romans is quickly becoming one of my favorite books of the Bible the more I spend time in it. A lot of people would say Romans 8 is one of their favorite chapters in the Bible. Life in the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sinning his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit... Let me, let me restate that. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Yeah, I can see why people like this one. All right, Peter, take us into this. Okay, so um, first thing that really struck me right away in verse one, um, you know, it's one of my one of my favorite verses. So not just book chapter, but <laughs> verse. Um, There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And what's really struck me um, just recently now reading this is. That's only the case because Christ himself was condemned on our behalf. Mm -hmm. We have no condemnation because he himself was condemned. And that just, it just really struck me. Um, and so uh, just a, a great reminder of, of what, again, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not anything that we have done on our own, but because of what Christ has done for us. Um, and then I, I think... I guess we have to kind of make the connection back to um, chapter 7 as well, you know, just to bring it together, where Paul talks about, you know, the, the good I want to do, mm -hmm. I don't do, and the very mm -hmm. things I don't want to do is what I do. Um, and I think one thing uh, for me, it just reminds me of the, um, and I forget the, the Latin phrase, but uh, how we are simultaneously saint and sinner. Yeah. Um, and I see that so well described in these two chapters. Um, and we have this life in the spirit, and we we, we have this new life, but yet <laughs> we continue to sin. Um, sin no longer reigns over us; it doesn't determine my my destination, um, but it is still in me. And so there's that constant battle. Yeah, that you were still infected. Yes, we still have some yeah. kind of infection that's that's right. going to mess with us until our last day. Yeah. And we're infected with the Spirit, too. We are. Thanks Thank, be to God. Thank, <laughs> thanks be to God the yes. Spirit penicillin is stronger than the infection of the virus there. Um, but yeah, that, they both, that, that internal battle. And this is one of those verses that I could see leading with to someone and discipling them, but you couldn't just lead with this and leave it alone. Like there's no con now, yeah, no yeah, condemnation yeah. for you who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Oh, sweet! So I yeah. can just keep doing whatever I'm doing. God's right. happy with me. And it's like no, let's let's talk about why there was condemnation to begin with, and why now it's um, why you have been set free. Mm -hmm. Where were you imprisoned, and why were you imprisoned, and why was there even an imprisonment? And so we we have to read this in the context of an acknowledgement that. I'm sinful. I'm a sinful creature, and I need to be restored and redeemed. There's something wrong with me. Yeah, yeah that's so important because we, if you don't know what you're freed from, how can you truly experience freedom? Right. That, the word therefore carries a lot of weight yeah. in Romans. And so combining it, I like what you pointed out there, Peter, that there is therefore now no condemnation. Mm -hmm. Well, you read the first two and a half chapters of Romans, <laughs> and Paul just pounds you with condemnation. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're religious or a pagan, it doesn't matter. You are condemned under the law. And uh, so you are condemned. You, you do have condemnation, but not now. 
now you have life in Christ. And so, and just to reiterate what you're both saying, um, to read it in the full context of Romans is, is it, I think it would be hard reading all of Romans to get to what you were describing, Mark, right? Like, oh, there's no condemnation. I can just kind of do what I want now. Mm-hmm. But if you read in the context yeah. of all of Romans, there's such relief to get here and go, oh, even, like you pointed out, Peter, that conflict we still experience, that Romans 7 conflict, um, in which when, when we do the things we ought not do and don't do the things we ought to do, the devil's in our ear. Mm-hmm. You're such a loser. How can you even call yourself a Christian? I mean, people would, people would be horrified to see and know what you'd think and do. And so we need to again and again hear that word. No, there's no condemnation. That is not the voice of Jesus. Yeah. And we hit that verse one, there's no condemnation. Then I, if I had to really like super sum this up, then I'd say, okay, now jump to five. For those who live according to their flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. So we have to be, I think we have to be careful. It's that, yes, I'm saved by grace through faith. There's no condemnation for me. But now I'm called to live differently. I'm called to be weird according to the world. I'm called to act in ways the world goes, man, that person just cut you off. Like I had a, <laughs> I had a guy that went around me to turn right onto the access road of seven of uh, Bush this past weekend. Like went, came from behind me, went around me. And my nature was to just find him, chase him down. Um, but, but it's like, okay, like, my kids are in the back seat. What, am, what example am I setting for them in how I'm living? I'm called to be something different and live according to the Spirit. And so if I'm living according to the Spirit, then I look to the text of Scripture and I say, well, what does that mean? Oh, I've got to be kind. I've got to be gentle. I've got to be forgiving. I've got to be uh, slow to anger. I've got to be uh, slow to speak, quick to listen. Like all these things of, of what the, the Spirit dwelling within us is to empower us, enable us um, to live differently. Because why? Because we have this beautiful gift of being set free from condemnation and eternal death, like never ending death, never ending suffering. How do I even wrap my brain around that? But I know it's something I don't want to toy with. It's not something to take casually. And I'm pretty sure this is the first time in Romans that Paul mentions the Holy Spirit. And so I, that's where Romans 8 just kind of explodes. Like you have Romans 6 saying, hey, you're free from sin. But then Romans 7 is this confession like, eh. like you said, Peter, it may not rule me anymore. It, doesn't, it can't condemn me eternally, but I still struggle. But then Romans 8 is, no, there's no condemnation. But it's not just try harder now. It's almost like going back to our Ezekiel passage. Like, all right, well, the bone's got some sinews and muscles and tendons, but it's still just kind of lying there. Mm-hmm. You know, come on, body, get up. Try harder, try harder, mm-hmm. get up. And God's saying, no, that's not the solution. The solution is the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. So he breathes his Spirit. We receive that Spirit. And it is exactly what you said, Mark, to empower us to live a new kind of life. Yeah, see, I think even as believers, some, sometimes we can feel like, oh, woe is me, I'm just a sinner, you know, I can't do any good. Um, yeah, we totally forget that the, <laughs> the Spirit of God lives in me right. and enables me to do that. And so, yeah, I think, again, going back to that whole the saint and sinner, I, I think because we could also get the other side of it too and think, oh, I, now, I'm, now I'm a saint or now I'm you know, a child of God. I, and then you, you may really start to question your faith because then oh, why am I still doing it <laughs> if I'm... If I've been changed, why am I still doing these things? And anyway, just recognizing that both are are there. And we're still in the flesh. Like verse seven, for the flesh is hostile to God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we are still like I did this with the preschool kids. I was like, grab your skin. See that? <laughs> That's flesh. Like we are flesh. We're human beings. And as long as we're in this state, in this life, the flesh is gonna constantly, the old Adam's gonna constantly be pulling us back to the ways we know we shouldn't be doing. Like, I think you, Peter, you referenced Paul was saying, I don't do the things I want to do. I'm doing the things I don't want to do. Yep. And we constantly have that tug of war, but the spirit dwells within us to help us have a fighting chance in that tug of war. The thing I think is most critical is though, 
Am I fighting against that spirit? Because, I mean, I, I know in my own life, the Holy Spirit will say, don't do this. And I go, I know better than you. And I go do it, and then I regret it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like that, God, you fool. At what point are you going to start listening more to the Spirit than to your own flesh? And that gets us to verse 6. Um, so while we still have a sin nature, which means we won't perfectly obey, it doesn't mean we're completely powerless because mm. we do have the Spirit. And one of the things we actually have a lot of control over is where we set our mind, what we think about. And it doesn't mean people like me don't get distracted every four seconds or so, but even so, I still have the capacity to recognize, oh, wait, I got distracted. I need to come back to, man, I was reading God's Word, and I need to come back to that. And I can do that, right? Mm-hmm. I can choose like, oh, I was looking out the window. I'm going to look back down at God's Word now and continue to read now, I might have to do that about 73 times during a morning devotion, but I can choose where I set my mind. Yeah. And, and so it's not, I can obey perfectly, but I can keep coming back to not send, setting my mind on the things of the flesh. Yeah. Not watching and looking and seeking out things that are fleshly, but seeking the things of the Spirit. And, and when I do that, I'm opening myself to the Spirit's work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what comes to mind to me is, is, say I have a problem with cussing, stop exposing myself to movies that have and TV shows that have cussing. Mm-hmm. And, it, it, and you, you could say, well, I'm an adult. I can filter it out. I can make, keep it in context. Garbage. It will infect your brain to where it becomes so normal in your head that when you get angry, it just pops out and you're like, God, where did that come from? Well, you expose yourself to, to certain stuff, it eventually becomes... A part of your nature, just like if you expose yourself to certain dialects, may say maybe you're in a certain part of the the country, a certain region, and then you come home and everybody's like, "Why are you talking like that?" Well, because I've been around it for a, a full week, and it just, you just absorb it. I would accuse my wife of that when her family lived in Atlanta. <laughs> We'd go back. I'm like, "Why are you talking this way? Who are you?" <laughs> yep. But yeah, I think that's a great point. And like Peter was saying earlier, sometimes I think, "Oh, I cussed again," and well, I'm just a sinner. Yeah. Oh, well, can't do anything about it. Well, yeah, Yeah. that's true, and your sin nature does push you in that direction. But also, you've set your mind on those things, and you've Mm -hmm. made that more likely and easier And versus now doing the kind of the hard work of saying, no, I'm going to set my mind on the Spirit. And it doesn't—the transformation is rarely instantaneous, but over time you find, wow, I've kind of lost my desire for the old fleshly thing. Mm Mm-hmm as I continually come back to setting my mind on the things of the Spirit. Yeah, and the transformative work God does through prayer. If you've identified some way in your life that needs to change and you spend time in devoted prayer to it, I believe that God makes that happen. In, in I'm going to be careful here, but God makes that happen because I think prayer is, prayer for me changes my mindset on things. Prayer for me gives me, I guess something I can do that makes me feel like something's changing. And I feel like God works through me in almost kind of like peaceful, meditative way when I'm praying to him about something like, Lord, help me rid me of this. And if I just pray that, I'm being careful here because I don't want to say I'm doing it, but there's something about praying to God about something that brings transformation and change in our life. Mm -hmm. It may take a while. But there's something about about that versus me going, well, I got this huge problem. I'm never going to pray to God about it. I'll just have to hope something happens better. Mm-hmm. I don't think it. I don't think it works so much like that. Right. Right. Let's run to our gospel text here. And oh boy, is this a long one? Y'all hold on. I'm going to read this, but uh, then I'm going to shut up because this is a long one. So this is John 11 verses. 1 through 45, 45 straight verses. This might be our longest reading ever on Sunday preview. But it's going to happen. So this is the death of Lazarus and everything that comes after it. And again, this is one of those stories where we can go, yeah, I know it. But it's also a really, really impactful story. So here it is, 11, 1, John 11, 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair his brother Lazarus was ill. So the sis- sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so that the son of God may be glorified through it. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, O friend Lazarus has fallen, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console, their concerning, to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. You have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. He had said these things. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had, been di- the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Here ends the longest reading on Sunday. <laughs> As I was reading this, I'm thinking, David, there's like 12 different sermons that could be written from this. Yes. So lead us into this, David. What are your, well, what are your and initial then thoughts? All uh, the, just 10 sermons. Just ten, yes. ten, at least 10. All the drama being played out here. Like, I'm kind of glad we read the whole thing because um, there's an option to sk- cut some of this. But, I mean, just... Just the human drama, right? So Lazarus is very sick, so they send for Jesus, mm-hmm. and he delays coming. And so then he dies, and Mary and Martha both say to him, if you had been here, oh, like there's a note of accusation there, and honestly something I've never really paid much attention to before. So obviously the disciples are doing the typical disciple thing. They got it all mixed up, Right. Jesus has to tell them he's not asleep. I just, you know, he's really dead. But but they've just warned him. Like, man, they're, those folks in the area are trying to kill you. So they think Lazarus has been killed. And now we're, and it's. Jesus is yeah, next. But it's yeah, so yeah. sweet, Thomas. Verse like 16, we give him a hard yeah. time being doubting Thomas. But he says, let us also go with him that we may die with him. Like there's a real tender like, well, I guess this is it. Let's go die. So, I mean, Thomas is right there. I, I've never really seen that part of Thomas. Um, but then Jesus cries. Jesus wept. You know, he wept 
over Lazarus's death. So I don't know. I just I love all the human emotion that comes out here. Just the raw honesty that comes out when we come face to face with death. And there's so much like up and down. Yes. I could, what what struck me at the very beginning was when they're like Jesus Lazarus, the guy you love, the close you know, it's a close brother to you. He's sick. Let's go to him. And, and then Jesus says, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God's Son of Man be glorified. <laughs> My sinful nature wanted to go, me, 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 me. What? Are you <laughs> yeah. serious? Right. Like, are you really going to say that right now? But, I mean, it's, <laughs> that's a human nature. It's God saying, it's Jesus saying, like, there's a bigger thing happening right. here. And it's calling for an incredible amount of trust from these true sisters. But, yeah, I almost started laughing and reading that one. So, Peter, what are your thoughts here? Well, to go right to the, uh, I guess, the finale of the story, um, you know, all Jesus has to say is, Lazarus, come out. And so I think just it just speaks to the power of his word. Yeah. And, um, of course, uh, again, today we still have his word, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, uh, in, in scriptures, that there is power in these words, too. Um, and so... And just a great reminder of, of uh, yeah, by he, he did many miracles by his actions, but simply just by his word, he can bring life. Yeah. And I like the little details in there. In the tomb, four days. Hands and fi- his hands and feet were bound, his face wrapped in a cloth. So it's like goes back to our Old Testament story where the bones are very dry, where there's, it's full death. It's four days of death. It's not a trick. And yet Christ says, Lazarus, come out. And that is where he comes out. So it, it defies logic. It shows God's power over you know, life and death, literal <laughs> life and death. Um, and it's just, it speaks, I'm glad you brought up the word. It speaks to the power, the transformative power of God's word. And we think the word is like everything we do in the ministry is based on the word. Like we don't just baptize with water. No, it's water and word. It's the power of the word. It's the word that, that, uh, that makes, you know, the, the sacraments what they are. It's the word that brings people to faith. It's the word that leads to eternal life. It's all that. It's the word. And we see a great example right here of, of the power of his word. I love that, that last word we read, unbind him and let him go. Mm. And I just think, I mean, that is our hope of resurrection that this, I mean, think about, it. I mean, some of us at this table are older than others, um, but we even see in our bodies the, the marks of death, right? I mean, um, one author says, uh, you know, you look at an older person, and it's like, Eve, what happened? Adam, what happened? You know, we just, mm-hmm. as death creeps up on us, if, we're, if we live a long time, the, the signs of death begins to envelop us and bind us, and, and our bodies begin to break. And yet in the resurrection, there'll be a sense of unbind him, you know, those, those, those death cloths are not appropriate for the believer. It's very humbling. Like the, the fact that our bodies are perishable and we are, everyone is slowly dying physically. Mm. Like that's a, that's a really humbling thing. And when you come to face that and you come to see, oh, I can't do what I did yesterday. And you really see it in a tangible way. It, it knocks you down. It knocks your ego sure. down a couple of rungs. Um, <laughs> I hit that recently with a knee problem. And I thought, oh, this is new territory. Even if I wanted to go help that person, I can't help them right now because I'm basically just hobbling around. So it's, I think to me that speaks to, yeah, you fully depend on God. You fully, and as you get older, you're only going to fully depend on God even more. Um, so there's something about that as the, as the body breaks down through the spirit, the, 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 the spirit within us, sanctification gets built up and maybe it's like it's a it's a close a greater closeness to God because we start seeing that all the things we once thought we were in control of are getting taken away. Yeah. And there's something to that. But what hope that Jesus's word he commands death, let him go, right? Yeah. And death has to obey. Death yeah. has no yeah. claim on him. I think though, you know, Lazarus still will die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> still will mm-hmm. die again. Again, physically, but then, you know, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, he will resurrect us for eternity. Yeah. I always wanted to know more about Lazarus. Yeah. Like, what happened from here? Because 
if you just glance ahead to verse 12, you know, initially he raises Lazarus, and so they plot to kill Jesus because oh, yeah. everyone saw it, and it's a big deal. But then they plot to kill Lazarus. I think, man, poor guy. Yeah. He died, and but now he's back, and now they're trying to kill him yeah, again. Like, just like, I want to know more about his story of how it played out from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're all about trying to kill him because, hey, we need to, we need to snuff out this story. We yeah. Oh, yeah. This. Yeah. No, people yes. are going, holy smokes, he can right. raise the dead. Uh, yeah. We might ought to listen to him. Right. And I, I love the emphasis on the, the both you were making about the word of God because I can see people today going, well, how do I really know I'm forgiven? Like, how do I really know that this sin I committed, God has really forgiven it? Well, it says it in the word. Like, the word has proclaimed you forgiven. It's the power of the word. I, that's it. And here's an example of the power of the word. And here's a, go back to Ezekiel. There's an example of the power of the word. And you tie the Romans text, you've been set free. Why? Because the word says so. Yeah. I mean, it, that's it. And I, and I imagine that leaves some people kind of unsatisfied because it's like, like, what do you mean the word? But it's like, if it's written in here and you're in faith, then it's truth and it applies to you personally. So yes, you are forgiven. Period. End of story. In one sense, that verse 44 is, is similar to Romans 8.1, right? Romans 8.1, there's now, therefore now no condemnation. Mm-hmm. In one sense, that's the same as unbide him and let him go. Mm-hmm. You know, when guilt and shame are trying to bury the believer, Jesus' word is, unbind him, let him yeah. go. There's no condemnation. Yeah. Which is incredibly freeing, but also incredibly difficult to make sense of sometimes. Because the person, whoever the person is in, whatever the the sin that's binding them, it's very, very tactile and tangible for them in their life, and they feel it every day. And Jesus is saying, it's over and done. It's over and done. And that's hard for us to, the sinful flesh wants to go, no, it's still there. The devil wants to go, no, it's not really. Did he really say, don't touch that tree? Did he really say your sins are forgiven? Right. Are you sure? And just keeps planting that seed. Which that's is- why we keep going back to, we keep getting, that's why we stay in the word, because we need to be reminded of stuff like this. Sorry, I think that's where you were going. Yeah, set your mind on the things of the right. Spirit. Absolutely, because I need to keep hearing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, why do I need to keep reading my Bible? Well, because the world and the devil and the flesh is pulling you in the other direction of darkness and despair. You need to be back in here. I need to be back in here so that I'm constantly reminded of the truth of it. One of our uh, confirmation parents asked a question. You know, their son had, had kind of pushed back against going to church and saying, you know, I, I kind of know all that. Uh-huh. But, but just basically what sure. you just said there, it's like knowing stuff's important. Sure. You need to know stuff. But, man, we're in a battle. Mm-hmm. We're in a battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it's not just knowing stuff. It's, it's living and trusting and resisting and getting knocked down and getting back up through rep- confession and repentance and yeah, I need to, even the stuff yeah. I know, not, and, I, and we don't know it all, but even the stuff I do know, I need to hear again and again and again. Yeah. I love to equate that always to exercise. This is where my mind lives. And yeah, I ran once. Yeah, but it's been 10 years. I know how to yeah, run. Yeah, but I know how to run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're not seeing the benefits of that running now because you don't run anymore. So it's like, it's kind of like that. We've got to get back to... Because this is, I mean, this is, this is what reminds us of that, okay, there is a better day coming. There is something coming. Any last thoughts? All right, folks, hope you all enjoyed this. Hope this was fruitful for you in some way. We're in the fifth Sunday in Lent. Um, come on, and join us at worship, 2708 Virginia Parkway, 830 and 11, Bible study in between. Um, we're almost at Holy Week. So we're almost at the great, one of the best weeks in the church year because it, Super heavy, but it's also super triumphant and joyful. So come on, join us for worship here in McKean, Texas. Y'all have a good one.